Good morning, happy Lord's Day to you. The title of the message this morning is My House. But as you'll see, it's not about my house. <laughs> I'm quoting someone on that. Uh, I look back at the day of Pentecost when the church first began, and everything about the church in its inception was pure. And uh, Acts chapter 2 describes the first church like this. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. I'm in awe of this early church. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, that was their church then, the temple courtyards. Breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Don't you like that simplicity of heart? Sometimes less is more. Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. There was a purity to it and a sense of awe in just being there together with uh, like-minded believers. But it didn't last very long. That's Acts chapter two. By the time we get to chapter five, the pollution begins. We have the account of a man and his wife. You remember Ananias and Sapphira. Most people don't name their kids Ananias or Sapphira anymore because of this. And uh, apparently they sold a possession. They put their offering in the offering plate, but they held back part of it for themselves and they lied about it to the church. They made it appear as though they gave it all. Now Peter confronts Ananias about this. How Peter knew it, I don't know. It doesn't say someone came up and said, you know, guess what Ananias did. I'm thinking maybe is what we call a word of knowledge where the Holy Spirit reveals something to you that is factual, but there's no other way you would know it if the Spirit hadn't told you. Anyway, Peter confronts Ananias um, and being confronted publicly, Ananias falls down dead in the church. Thank God for the young men of the church. Amen. Amen. The young men came up, wrapped him in whatever, carried him out and buried him. We need young men in the church for just that kind of an occasion. Should any one of you just drop that in the aisle, we're going to find the two youngest men, Zach, you're obviously one, <laughs> to wrap them up, carry them out, and bury them. Now, the story continues. Three hours later, Sapphira comes in. She gets confronted, and she drops dead in the church. And those wonderful young men do the same with her. And it, it ends the story by saying, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things, I guess so. That would get your attention, would it not? How was church service today? Well, how much, how much time have you got? <laughs> Let me tell you, it was really quite something. So what lessons do we learn from this? Because it was a financial matter, really. And, and lying about it was the thing. Religion often attracts what we call wolves in sheep's clothing. There are people that look and sound exactly like a follower of Jesus, but inwardly they are, as Jesus said, ravenous wolves. And uh, many people see the church as a way just to make money. Uh, they sneak in and exploit the sheep for money. Uh, as Jude put it, they, they will merchandise you, literally is what he said. And there are many that pursue ministry not as, as a calling, but as a vocation, like a a step up in, in, the, in the job path, in a career path, just to earn money. Um, I think that's a shame. Some hawk their wares on television, you know? They'll, they'll sell you that handkerchief that they wipe the sweat off their brow, and they'll sell that to you, because that's anointed. It's just full of the anointing. You might want to wash it out, put it in the lobby. 
Um, some promised miracles in exchange for money. Benny Hinn is one of the most famous at doing that. Yet their own opulent and extravagant lifestyles give them away. Mm -hmm. You want to watch out for the quote-unquote man of God who is becoming rich from the flock. Does he own expensive homes and luxury cars? Just to put your mind at ease, I drive a 2004 Honda Odyssey with 350,000 miles on it. And I don't have a watch, so I can't wear a Rolex, you know? But it's amazing how these people, these charlatans, just rake in the dough. And I guess what H.L. Mencken once said is so true, no one ever went broke underestimating the intelligence of the American people. Or, as uh, P.T. Barnum once said, there's a sucker born every minute. They fly around in their private jets, and if you're Jesse Duplantis, you've got to ask your parishioners, your constituents, for another $15 million because your jet doesn't have the ability to fly quite far enough without refueling, so you need a, another jet. These should be loud warning bells. You don't see any of this going on in Acts chapter 2. It was pure, it was beautiful, it was simple but the church starts to deteriorate by chapter five and it's never been the same since. If you'll notice in your Bible, God often uses the stewardship of finances to expose the true thoughts and intentions of a person's heart. It's a measure, if you will. There's one passage where Paul is talking about churches coming forward with an offering and he basically says, Put your money where your mouth is. So financial matters often will reveal a person's heart. And you'll notice as we read the scripture this morning that to Jesus, the purity of God's house is not negotiable. There can be no compromise. Now in his day, what the chief priests and the scribes were willing to allow, Jesus vehemently condemned and he did that more than once as we'll see now he enters we just saw uh, what we call the triumphal entry last Sunday into Jerusalem as he enters Jerusalem on Passover week where does he go first he goes to the temple courts that's where he wants to be that's kind of his habit from the time he was 12 years old he had to be at the temple in the courtyard and he had to be about his father's business so Whatever the city might hold in store, his father's business was always Jesus' priority. That should be said of all of us. And at one time, I think maybe it was in the church. So let's find out what Jesus uh, notices and what he sees as he enters the temple courts. We're gonna be reading this morning from Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 to 17, if you'll follow with me or just listen says this, then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. So you could come to the temple courts and purchase a sacrifice rather than bring one with you, which is maybe a little handy and convenient if you're coming from a far distance, you don't wanna carry a, a dead animal too far. And so you could buy one there if you wanted to. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, I want to just real quickly draw a distinction for you between what he is saying and what you think he might have said. He said den of thieves. The word is literally robbers. And you might say, well, what's the difference? A thief will steal from you intending to keep it, but he doesn't want publicity, he doesn't want confrontation, he wants to slip in and out and get your stuff and go. Whereas a robber uses violence, uses confrontation, and he's literally calling them a den of robbers because they have gotten uh, aggressive with their promoting activities in the temple court. And they are strong-arming people, if you will. So uh, robbers, not thieves. And uh, well, let's, let's read the rest of that. Uh, because you have the bad part of the temple court, and then you have the good stuff that follows. 
There's always something good at a church, amen? amen? There's some bad, but there's some good too. Amen. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. I can't see where Jesus ever refused to heal somebody that wanted it. I've never read anything like that. Everybody that comes to him and says, this is what I'd like, and he does it. But when the, you know who got upset? When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Have you ever met an indignant church person that was like in control, somebody maybe, an elder, a deacon, a board member, who, who on occasion got indignant? It ain't fun working under those conditions. They were indignant. They said to him, do you hear what these are saying? These little kids shouting, Hosanna. And Jesus said to them, have you never read? And here again, he's going to quote scripture. He does that a lot. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany. And he lodged there. He lodged there. So let's go back to the, uh, the money changers and the sellers of doves and such as that. You picture Jesus coming into the temple courtyards and you see that he is overturning tables and chairs, just flipping them over onto the ground, stuff scattering everywhere. And you imagine, probably, that he must be emotional. He must be fairly angry at this point. And his, his blood is seething and his pressure's going up and he's, he's getting mad. Because if, if that were us, that's what we would be doing. He's done this before. This is not the first time. If you read uh, the account of the wedding at Cana, where he performed his first public miracle, right after that, he went into Jerusalem, again, Passover week, and who's in the temple courtyards? Money changers and, and sellers of merchandise. And he makes a whip out of cords and drives them out. That's fairly dramatic, isn't it? <coughs> now, the scripture that pertains to that is, is uh, he has zeal for God's house. He's zealous. Zealous, jealous, basically the same word in the Greek. It means there's heat. There's fervency. But I don't see that in either case he is emotionally overwrought or he's out of control. At the end of it, each instance, it simply says, and he said to them, not he yelled at them or he, you know, shook his fist at them. He just simply says to them, it is written. And he quotes Isaiah 56, verse seven, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And then he follows that with a quote from Jeremiah 7, 11, which reads, I'll read it from Jeremiah. God asks the question, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? So he did it before John chapter two with a scourge of small cords. Here he does it apparently with a look, with a frown, with a word of command. And such is his authority that no one opposes him. No one that is except, of course, the chief priests and scribes who are what? Indignant. Wonderful. As I read this, there was one particular phrase that jumped out at me, which is why I used it for the title of the message. It is his pronouncement, my house shall be, my house. We call that a possessive pronoun. It means the house belongs to Jesus. The house belongs to God. It's his house, right? So I want to take that, go beyond the temple court, uh, Jesus' day, even beyond the fellowship halls and the assemblies and the churches of today that people will call his house. And I want to make it personal. People say, well, don't take it personal. I say, well, then don't make it personal. But God, all more often than not, makes it personal. He brings it, boils it down to you and me. On the one hand, Believers are commanded not to neglect the assembly. It's, it's, it's not, you know, an option. It's not, it's not a suggestion. It says, do not neglect the assembling together of yourselves as some are in the habit of doing. 
but encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. So believers are commanded not ne to neglect the assembly. On the other hand, that presents a problem sometimes called church shopping. How many of you have ever been church shopping? We've all, I'm sure, done it at one point in our lives. Uh, we're looking for that place where we want to stay, where we feel that we're in God's purpose by being there, that that's a good place to be. But church shopping isn't all that much fun. I don't know if you notice that. I, I don't care for it. It's like dating. I was so glad when I finally married this woman because now I don't have to date anymore and set myself up for possible rejection. I've got the wife. I can put that behind me. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, honey. <laughs> it's much like church shopping. You want to you want to land someplace where you can just stop looking. And as people like to say, it's always the last place you look. Why is that? Because when you find it, you stop looking. <laughs> that makes it the last place. <laughs> so, finding a fellowship, yes, it, it's hard. Uh, if you can get past the loud performance of some of the praise teams that are up on stage with neon and flashing lights and smoke machines and all kinds of stuff to entertain you, if you get past that, and if you can look the other way when you see that the pastor's tennis shoes cost as much as your car, uh, you might find that the church of Acts chapter 2 is a very foreign quantity indeed. Very difficult to find that purity. So let's say that you shop around and you find a church fellowship where the emphasis is not on entertainment or merchandise, but on worship and on the Word of God. How's that sound? Good thing? Sound good? Yeah. Jesus said the, the time is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. Those are the ones that God wants to worship him. You want to be in a place where you can pray in the midst of whatever's going on and you don't feel distracted. You can be in the middle of a song, in the middle of a sermon, in the middle of anything and still communicate with God you and he one on one without distraction Jesus said my house shall be called a house of prayer so let's make it personal now God commands purity not only in the temple courts as Jesus showed us not only in the various assemblies where Christians gather, but in the individual believer, probably most importantly, in the individual believer, that's his command for purity. When Jesus says, my house, he's not just talking about a courtyard, he's not just talking about a building, he's not just talking about a house of worship, he's talking about you and me. Let me tell you how I know that. So I read this in Hebrews chapter 3. Here's the first six verses. Listen closely. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses was also faithful to all in his house. For this one, that is, Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his household as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. And here it comes. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. Christ as a son over his house, whose house we are. So that brings it all the way down to one-on-one. -on -one. We are his house if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We are the house. Jesus said, my house, that's you, that's me. Now, I grew up in the church, in the Methodist church back east, 
And you know, as little kids want to do, they want to explore, you know, the balcony and run around and do this and that. And they said, no, 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 this is God's house. You have to conduct yourself accordingly. You're in God's house now. So I always thought God's house was that building that we went to on Sunday morning, the structure. And uh, it's all about how we conduct ourselves in God's house. Is God's house to you a place that you go on Sunday morning? Do you go to church? Let me change that. Are you church? Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He wasn't talking about a structure. He was talking about people. So we don't go to church. We are church. Somebody said, where are you going on Sunday morning? I'm going to church. Really? Aren't you church now? You got to go someplace to be that. Well, I thought the church was the building. Jesus is my house. He's talking to you and to me. We are his house. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? You're, you're the temple. So when we see him in the temple courts and how he is non-negotiable on the purity of it, it translates to us as the temple of the Spirit of God, as the house of Jesus. We are his house. When we are no longer that kind of a house that he described, that God ordained for us to be, we have lost our way. We get so caught up in the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of riches, as the proverb says, the parable says, that we cease to be, forget to be, the kind of house God made us to be. What is that? My house shall be a house of what? Prayer, house of prayer. Now, this is not a new problem. It's not just that you and I don't pray enough, don't pray as much as we should. We have a, a hymn, I don't know if we're gonna sing that today, no, not today, but we will at some point called Sweet Hour of Prayer. Can you imagine actually praying for an entire hour, 60 minutes, can you imagine? We're supposed to go into our inner room and shut the door and talk to God. That's what we're supposed to do. How often do we do that? Oftentimes the prayer life of any given Christian in any given church on any given Sunday is when the pastor or the elder says, every head bowed, let's pray, you know, and that's, that was it. Got my prayer in for the week. We're supposed to be that house of prayer in constant communication with the Father, constantly taking our desires, our, our, our wants, our wishes, listening to him, not just talking at him, but listening for what he's saying to us. And he will talk to you. He will, not audibly, but he'll impress, impress things upon you if you ask him. As I say, it's not a new problem. Good people get distracted by life and forget what God made them to be. Back in the days of the prophet Haggai, 600 years before Jesus, the exiles of Israel had returned to rebuild the temple, but they got distracted and they stopped building for like a couple of years. They just stopped. So God stirred up a couple of prophets, one of them's Haggai, to go and get the people moving again. And uh, when you hear what he had the prophet say, you can almost see this coming true in other people's lives, hopefully not your own. But you see how people get distracted, caught off, and forget what God made them to be and what he wants them to do. And here's what Haggai said to them. Thus speaks the word of the Lord of hosts, saying, this is God talking. This people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? this temple to lie in ruins don't think of just structures think of you and me now therefore says the Lord of hosts consider your ways you have sown much and bring in little you eat but do not have enough you drink but you're not filled with drink you clothe yourselves but no one is warm and he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes 
Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Wow. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. What are your priorities in life? Is it to be pleasing in the sight of God or just to have a comfortable way to travel until you leave this life? Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. My house, Jesus said, shall be a house of what? Prayer. Think about it. Are you that house? If not, I urge you to pray about it. You can be what he wants you to be. But you've got to put a little effort into it. So I would confess, I don't know anyone who said my prayer life is spectacular. I, I, have, I have nothing missing in my prayer life. It's just that good. We all have areas of opportunity. If we're going to be the house of prayer, that means you and I need to go into our, our inner room. And that could be your car. It could be your bedroom. It could be walking out in the yard. It's wherever you get alone with God. No distractions. No noise. Turn off the TV. Turn off the radio. Don't talk to anybody. Talk to him. And then listen and see what he says to you. That's, that's a house of prayer. That's something to aspire to. So... Uh, so concerned was Jesus about this that he got dramatic when he came to where it should have been and it was not. I thank God for his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, and his love for all of our many shortcomings in Jesus' name. He still loves you. Don't be afraid of him. God's not mad at you, by the way. He loves you. He died for you. So just say thank you and pray a little more. Amen.